Hello, I'm Christy Young, and this is a podcast from the Desert Island Discs Archive. For rights reasons, we've had to shorten the music. The programme was originally broadcast in 1978, and the presenter was Roy Plumley. On this occasion, our castaway is the celebrated concert pianist Vladimir Ashkenazi. Mr Ashkenazi, did you find it difficult to choose just eight records, this meagre eight? Yes, very difficult, yes. I could have chosen probably close to a (laughs) hundred. What's the first one you have then? Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony. Why do you choose it? I think that Rachmaninoff is, uh, to my mind, is perhaps the most Russian of Russian composers. Uh, I can't really impress my opinion. It it can be quite irrational. I just simply feel that his expression is the most Russian, the yes. most complete also. The opening of the slow movement of the Rachmaninoff Second Symphony, Andre Previn conducting the London Symphony Orchestra. Now, you were born in Russia in the town of Gorky. That wasn't the original name of the town, was it? No. Um, the original name was Nizhny Novgorod. And, and it was renamed after the writer? After the writer, correct. You moved to Moscow when you were very little? Yes, when I was three, I think. And there was a lot of music in your home? My father is a pianist, yes. and... Um, there was some music in our home, not very much, and it wasn't classical, it was popular. And but your mother, uh, is she musical? No, my mother is not. Uh, but she was the one who noticed that I was rather interested in music. You started, what, to play the piano, to teach yourself the piano? Uh, no, we didn't have an instrument. Uh, only when I was six, I remember, my mother asked me whether I would like to start studying, mm-hmm. playing an instrument. And I said yes, and she asked me what instrument. I said the piano, because my father was a pianist. So that's how it started. Uh, music teaching in, in Russia is, is, is rather more intensive than here. Yes, the system is uh, such that gifted children are easily channeled to good music schools. It, it's a very good system in that respect. So you went on to the, the Moscow Conservatory. That's right. Mm. You began taking part in a lot of competitions. Was this uh, a standard part of the Russian musical education? At 18, you you won the second prize in the the Chopin competition. It's not a standard part of the education. It's, uh, let's say, it is the most desirable path for a young musician Mm. to be a winner of an international competition. And um, the system is somehow geared to that, that unless you win a competition, you have no chance... uh, being on a concert platform, and uh, I was uh, simply a cog in the wheels, you know, and I went to those competitions because I was sent there. There's one that you won in Belgium, yes. a competition which sounds terribly grueling for, for the Queen Elizabeth Prize. Yes, it is a very difficult one. The range of repertoire is enormous, and you have to learn a new piece in the final round, uh, a new unknown piece written specially for the competition in eight days and played with the orchestra. Mm-hmm. So that's difficult. Are, are you a quick study? Can you memorize easily? Yes, I'm rather quick. Fortunately, that's a gift from nature. <laughs> you had some very distinguished judges in that competition. Yes, we had Rubinstein, oh. Casa de Sioux, and uh, 
Gil else? And that earned you a tour of the United States? Um, I suppose so, yes. <laughs> I suppose that was the most important element. Of course, you still hadn't graduated. You had to go back to the conservatoire. And I think it was in your final year there that you, you met an Icelandic student who began to mean rather a lot to you. No, we met in 1958 when um, when she came to participate in the first Tchaikovsky competition yes. in which I did not participate. Then she came back in 1960 to study in the conservatory with the same piano teacher as I was studying with, uh, Mr. Lev Oborin. And that's when uh, we met a lot and we got married in 1961. Mm -hmm. And I graduated from the conservatory actually at the end of 1960. Let's have your second record. What will that be? Oh, the second record is uh, Mozart Piano Concerto, Kehl 595. Mm -hmm. The piece is so sublime that uh, one really fails to find the right words. I like almost all Mozart concertos enormously, but this one has something special, and I, I don't want to try to describe it, so I'll stop there. Who is the soloist on this recording? Here is uh, Daniel Barnboim with the English Chamber Orchestra. Who is a very good friend of yours. Yes, he is, yes. <laughs> to the first movement of the Mozart Piano Concerto No. 27 in B-flat major, Kirkel 595, Daniel Barenboim playing and conducting the English Chamber Orchestra. Now, your career was getting well, very well underway. You were a, a married man, and, and you took part yourself in the second international Tchaikovsky competition. That's right. And you won it. Yes, I, I, it was really against my will. I never wanted to participate. Uh, the authorities simply said to me a couple of times on a very high level that unless you participate, uh, you might as well forget about your career. The Russians wanted a Russian to win it. Was that the idea? They needed a very strong team and yes. they needed a leader. So they were trying to gather the strongest they had at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I belonged to that category at that moment. And uh, I married a foreigner, yeah. which is already an anathema in Russia, you see. And uh, they, they uh, what do you say, banked on it, yes? Yes, they, banked on it. Yes, they said, uh, well, you know what's happening with you. And uh, if, you, if you don't participate, you can count your international career finished. Oh, so <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> right. Well, you, you entered and you won. Although, in fact, you, you tied for the first prize with an Englishman, John Ogden. Yes. Uh, well, uh, for practical purposes, there's no difference whether, you, whether I tied or not. The most important was that I was also a winner, you yes, see. Yes. And for practical reasons, uh, it was enough. Yes. Because having won the first prize, I was in the position to count on international tours, of although I was married to a foreigner, you see. There are degrees in life in Russia where you know that this helps you and this doesn't. And if, even if you have some negative circumstances, you know which kind of a positive circumstance might uh, tip the balance in your favor. Yes. And that was it, you see. So it did lead to a lot more overseas engagements. Now, there was a complication. Your wife, Thorin, didn't enjoy living in Russia. No, well, it's not surprising. It's difficult to adapt yourself to those circumstances. Mm. Although uh, Icelandic, she had been brought up in England. Yes, that's true, basically in England. But she's very much Icelandic, of course. Mm. Um, well, it, it was hard to, to, to live in Russia. It's hard for Russians to live in Russia, and it's 
infinitely <laughs> harder for foreigners to try to live there. Yes. But the problems aren't just the lack of uh, the usual freedoms which we take for granted in the West. It's not only that, but um, the problem with her was also that um, many Russians became suspicious that she wanted to actually live in Russia. They don't expect that foreigners would like to live in Russia and would like to openly try to adapt themselves. Uh, it's very strange, and uh, it, it's, it's n there isn't enough time really to explain it. But when she, in fact, took up Soviet citizenship, which was also actually imposed on mm -hmm. us, the, the people in the conservatory even suddenly became unfriendly. Because when she was a visitor, a foreigner, uh, it was one thing, but when a foreigner tries to be one of those, that's a different thing. They wouldn't like to mix with her. And that upset her very much. She didn't yes. expect that. So you decided to, to live in the West. This, of course, wasn't a political decision at all. It was simply, well, an emotional one. Uh, yes, initially it was very, very much emotional. But I was aware that any decision of this kind will have great political repercussions because anything concerning um, the West with Russia has political undertones and overtones and everything. It, everything is politically mm. coloured. And of course I was right. It was taken very much politically in Russia. Let's have some more music. What should we have? Yes, much better than politics, isn't it? <laughs> the next one is the one of the most sublime works. It's a Schubert string quintet in C major. I like the slow movement particularly there. Again, I failed to describe it. I think music will speak for itself. <laughs> The closing passage of the slow movement of the Schubert String Quintet in C major by the augmented Vienna Philharmonic Quartet. How much of the year do you spend travelling? I think seven or eight months. It's a long time to be away from home. And home, incidentally, now you moved your base to Reykjavik, to Iceland. That must be rather badly positioned for, for world travel. Yes, it isn't, it isn't so well positioned. And in fact, we have now divided our time between... Uh, Iceland and Switzerland, because mm. Switzerland is so centrally located. So we're sort of in between. You've done a great deal for musical life in Iceland. Oh, I, I wouldn't like to evaluate <laughs> what I've been trying to do in Iceland. I simply participated in the, in the musical life of Iceland as much as I could. Mm. I tried to organize a festival, bring some very well-known and wonderful artists, most of whom actually are friends of mine, so it was rather easy for me to get them there. And uh, I played a few times there and conducted the local orchestra, uh, but I don't attach too much value to what I've done. It's only natural. Uh, you believe in, in, in the casual approach. I saw you playing a Mozart concerto the other evening at the Festival Hall. There were 40 members of the London Symphony Orchestra sitting around in white tie and tails. You had a dinner jacket and a sweater. It's not exactly a sweater. Oh, you call it sweater. It's a, a white polo neck. Yes. yes. That's a you call it a sweater. Yeah, I call yeah. that okay, a sweater. fine. Okay. Um, I think one should play in something very simple and ordinary. And comfortable. And comfortable. And what I wear, I think, is quite ordinary, quite simple, and it's comfortable at the same time. I think tails should. Uh, sort of go away soon. I, I think it's 
almost like a masquerade. It, it doesn't relate to music at all, I think. Oh, no, no. Why are those would... things hanging behind you and the bow tie? Sometimes they look like waiters, I think. <laughs> <you know? laughs> There's no point 